Go big or go home. <laughs> we live in the world of the exclamation point. Words like extreme and revolutionary and have become part of our ordinary vocabulary. I mean, after all, nobody wants to say your kid goes to the ordinary academy. But the challenge is if we're always looking for the extraordinary, we might miss the ordinary everyday reality of God. Some of these ideas have made their way into the church. I remember as a young person, I went to a conference called Urbana in Champaign, Illinois. It's put on by World Vision. It's an office, Campus Crusade for Christ. Anyway, one of those guys. Anyway, 20,000 young people standing in an auditorium shouting, we're going to change the world for God. We're going to do extraordinary things. Think about it. This morning, here we are. We're not a mega church. Sometimes I wonder if we're a mini church. We don't have any fancy, well-known names. We're just a collection of farmers and moms and dads and students and kids. And we're dressed in our ordinary clothes, living ordinary lives. Yet, I would like to suggest that we can be extraordinary because that's how God works you think about it Jesus was born as a little baby in a manger to angelic fanfare but then for 30 years what kind of life did he live ordinary he was just an ordinary carpenter's son So in my experience, that's one of the dilemmas we face as Christians. I invented a word. I call it everydayness. Everydayness. Rod Dreher says, everydayness is my problem. It's easy to think about what you would do in wartime or if a hurricane blows through or if you spent a month in Paris or if your guy wins the election or you won the lottery, but it's a lot more difficult to figure out how are you going to get through today without despair. I once lived in a small one-bedroom apartment in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Wasn't much to look at, and I think my rent was less than 100 bucks a week, so you can imagine it wasn't a luxury place. I was one day cleaning up, and I was kind of singing and praying and wondering kind of what God was going to do with my life. And I was cleaning underneath the refrigerator. And I kind of heard the Lord say, can you worship me under, while you're cleaning under the refrigerator? And he seemed to prompt me with the thought that if you can't worship me while you're cleaning out under the refrigerator, I wonder if you ever worship me when you get together in a church or in a bigger gathering. 
The scripture this morning is from Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 19. I'll just highlight a few verses. But this is a story. Elijah was a great prophet of God. He had just had a miraculous thing happen. He challenged the gods of Baal and won immensely. And then he goes into this funk. He goes into this cave. And in 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13, we read this. The Lord God said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord himself is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after all of that came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. God wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the fire. He was in the ordinary, still small voice. This message comes inspired a little bit from a writer called Tish Warren Harrison. She's an Anglican priest, leader in the Anglican church. She's also a writer and a blogger. And she said, I've come to the point where I'm not sure anymore just what God counts as radical. She said, the bravery it takes to believe that a small life is still a meaningful life and the grace to know that even when I've done nothing, that is powerful or bold or even interesting, the Lord notices me and is fond of me. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your still small voice. Thank you for the ordinary. Thank you that as we gather here this morning as ordinary people in an ordinary place on just another ordinary Sunday, something extraordinary can happen because of who you are. I pray, Lord, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be pleasing to you. Amen. So I think there's three big words. And kids, these will be big words, but I'll try and make them simple. Are part of solving this dilemma of the ordinary. Three ways that we can maybe find the ordinary, the extraordinary in the ordinary. The first big word is vocation. Say that, vocation. And vocation is what we do, what we do, but it's more than your job. In fact, this was one of the doctrines of the Reformation that changed the whole of Europe. They say that this doctrine broke down the barriers between those who prayed and those who ruled, those who worked, changed. Luther said that changing diapers is holy work. Everyone can pray. Everyone works. And rightly understanding vocation just changes the quality of everything we do. 
Artists with a sense of vocation will not just create out of ambition or self-expression, but out of love and service, not to corrupt or denigrate, but to bless and to share. Workers and executives who see their customers as their vocation will serve them with their very best work. And vocation is really where the rubber meets the road for so many of us. You you grow spiritually. Vocation is where evangelism happens as Christians teach their children and interact with those who are yet far from God. Vocation is where cultural influence happens as Christians take their places and live out their faith in every niche of society. Now, it's easy to mentally acknowledge this as true. But our dilemma is we still live with this dichotomy or this difference that we're not quite enough. Being a student or a office worker or a factory worker or a farmer, it's good, but being a pastor is better. Being called to a missionary work is even better. Don't we live with this? 1 Corinthians 7, 17 says, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them. Whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them. There's a great story that I love. You may have heard it, I don't know, but there was this man, he was a bricklayer, and... He came upon this man laying bricks, excuse me, he was walking by and saw the bricklayer and he said, what are you doing? And the bricklayer said, I'm laying bricks. Like, can't you see? Then he walked a little further and there was another bricklayer and he said, What are you doing? He said, well, I'm building a wall of bricks. And he came upon a third bricklayer and he said, what are you doing? And he said, I am building a cathedral to the Almighty. You see, each of the bricklayers were laying bricks. But one had a perspective that he wasn't just laying bricks. I'm not just typing on the keyboard. I'm not just studying my homework. I'm I'm, I'm not just a homemaker. I'm doing something extraordinary. It's all in our perspective. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for who? For the Lord. As working for the Lord. You see, vocation or what we do encompasses your whole life. Not just what you do, but who you are and how you live and it relates to your whole life, teens to retirees and everything in between. between. It includes the full range of human experience, suffering and sin and discovery and joy and relationships. And so when I look out this morning, I see people with a vocation. I see marketplace ministers. I see holy homemakers. I see faith-filled farmers. I see revolutionary retirees, supernatural students, and kingdom kids. You see, it's all in our perspective. And if 
we're going to find the extraordinary in the ordinary. We have to come to a new sense of vocation. It's not just what we do. It's who we are and it's where we go and the things we do our whole life long. What's your perspective on your vocation? You are extraordinary. The second word I'd like to talk about this morning is another big word called adoration. Can you say that with me? Adoration. Adoration. I adore. I adore you. Adoration. We must get better at God's sightings. Joshua 1.9 says, For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go, wherever you go. I think in order to really appreciate adoration, and I thank you, uh, Jameson, for some of the words you shared this morning. You're helping us lift our eyes. We kind of, in a way, we have to become naive again. We have to learn how to choose wonder over cynicism. There's a great contemporary song out right now by Jeremy Camp. It says, Lord, keep me in the moment. Keep me in the moment. How many of you know that song? Oh, I won't sing it. I sing it in the car. You might see me through the window, but, you know, I won't sing it here. But it just says, oh, Lord, keep me in the moment. Help me live with my eyes wide open because I don't want to miss what you have for me. Throw away what I'm chasing after because I don't want to miss what you have for me. Oh, Lord, keep me in the moment. Keep me in the moment. It's hard, isn't it, to stay in the moment? It's hard to drop those cynical Facebook posts. It's hard to to, to say, where are you in the midst of all this, God? Where's the beauty? Where's the hope? Where's the joy? But if we look and say, keep me in the moment, We can find it. I have a good friend that's a cancer survivor. I loved that one of the things we shared on the program is from Linda Grunendike, one of our elders, and she's a cancer survivor. Many of you know what that's like. You either have a friend or you are yourself. Keep me in the moment. My friend Dale... He says, ordinary is highly underrated. Because you see, a year ago, Dale was in the ICU. And now I have coffee with him every Wednesday. He says, I love ordinary. I just love to get up every day. And see ordinary. Every breath is a gift from God. Another day full of his providence and blessing. God is everywhere and he cares for us deeply. A healthy adoration requires a heart that is soft enough to see Jesus in a sunset, to feel his love in the kiss of the wind, to know that when that coworker knocks on your door, that's a moment. God shows up even when we're not on retreat or having our quiet time. He invades grocery lines, football stadiums, cry rooms, and cafeterias he speaks in ways we expect and in ways 
we do not. Here's my challenge to you on adoration. Get yourself a little book or a little card or whatever. And at the top of it, I would like you to put glimpses of God. And in the next 30 days, every time you're in the moment, you see a glimpse of God. Maybe it's a laughter of a child. Maybe it's a sunrise. Maybe it's a conversation. Maybe it's just a prayer that comes to you. Jot it down. And chronicle how God makes himself known to you. So we've talked about vocation and we've talked about adoration. Vocation is what we do. Adoration is what we see. Now let's talk about a really big word, sanctification. Sanctification. What is God doing in me? 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, it's God's will that you should be sanctified. You see, each of us are sinners. That means we miss the mark. Some of you more than others, but God doesn't care. All of us have come short of the glory of God, and God deals with, with our sin in different ways. First of all, he paid for the penalty of our sin on the cross. And each day now, I'm empowered to live out of that new life toward maturity, and that is sanctification. When I break the power of sin. And there will come a day when we will have glorification, which we will be in heaven and removed from the presence of sin. But until then, what kind of lives do we lead? Ordinary lives. Everyday lives. And so we ask God to fill us, to come near to us, to show us and empower us and remove us from the power of sin and bring us into his presence. Sanctification, the primary crucible for sanctification is life with other people who are as messed up and broken as we are. We learn to dwell with God and to imitate him. We have practices like hospitality and listening and diligence and forgiveness and reconciliation and the daily drudgery of life with other people. I have a friend that says, I would be fine if it just wasn't for all these other people. <laughs> yes, but without those other people, we are not going to become sanctified because it's life with other people that teach us and we love to recite our lofty character traits, but we forget that it's under the refrigerator. The context of sanctification is fixing lunches and doing taxes and mopping floors and wiping bottoms and shaving and sweeping and driving and rising early and praying often. It's not in this room as much as it is in your everyday rooms, the everydayness of life. Tish Harrison 
goes on in her blog to say, now that I'm a 30-something with two kids living a more or less ordinary life, I'm slowly realizing that for me, being in the house all day with a baby and a two-year-old is a lot scarier and a lot harder than being in a war-torn African village. Caring for a homeless kid is a lot more thrilling than listening well to the people in my home. Giving away clothes and seeking out edgy Christian communities requires less of me than being kind to my husband on an average Wednesday morning or calling my mother back when I don't feel like it. You see the real message of Jesus that it, it is in the ordinary. It looked ordinary for Jesus to come to the earth. It looked like another baby being born in a cattle stall. The cross looked like just another form of persecution that the Romans used and there hung another spent prophet. Just another ordinary death of another guy who's a rabble rouser in the Roman community. Just ordinary stuff. When we take communion, it's bread and it's juice, just ordinary stuff. And you and I, just ordinary stuff. Dust, as we sang earlier. But what does he do with the ordinary? He takes that baby in a manger and allows him to live side by side, allows him to become a teacher and a healer and a life giver. He takes that ordinary death on a cross and he says, all the sin they ever committed and all the sin they ever will commit is dead on an ordinary tree. And he says to you and I, it's just an ordinary day. You're just an ordinary guy, ordinary gal, ordinary kid, ordinary grandma, ordinary computer geek, ordinary housewife, See, our life is filled with big and little things. And we try and weigh them out. We, our idea of what is big is sometimes small to God. And our idea of what's small is big to God. We have this flawed view of life and it's only shaped by our senses. But God sees what we cannot even fathom. And all of creation, including every moment of your life, is important to him. If you don't know that this morning, if you don't feel that this morning, trust it anyway, that it's true. And if you don't know Jesus, you haven't had an opportunity to have his extraordinary life touch yours I'd love to talk to you more about that. But whether we're changing diapers, fixing a machine, harvesting a crop, writing a paper, playing with our friends, or simply on a walk, 
what we do, what we see, and the changes he's making in you, in me. Those are ways that we can take our ordinary life and allow God to make it extraordinary. Pray with me. Thank you, God, for your goodness, for your grace. Thank you that you can take whatever it is that we are and find us to be extraordinary in your eyes. Thank you for each person here, each life, each family, each generation represented here and may you take us in our everydayness and teach us how to find the extraordinary in the midst of it all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.